On Health Matters Television for Life, most of us don't think twice about breathing, but those with lung disease say it's something you should never take for granted. There are days when I can't get up and walk five feet without getting out of breath. And the simplest task can be a struggle. I get out of air just drying off after a shower. From COPD to lung cancer, we'll explore warning signs and treatments and what you can do to reduce your risk of lung disease. Right now on Health Matters. Health Matters is made possible by our viewers, the friends of KSBS, and by Providence Healthcare. I'm Dr. Andrew Boulay, and when my wife had a cardiac arrest, I chose Providence because I knew that everything we needed for her complex care was available, from the emergency room to radiology to the nursing staff to the specialists we needed for her care. I'm Arnie Peterson, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I work at Sacred Heart for Providence Medical Group. When I needed my hip replaced, I chose Providence because of the professionalism and the care that I knew I'd receive. I never thought twice about going anywhere else. Good evening, I'm Teresa Lukens, and welcome to Health Matters. From the time we rolled the open of this show, about a minute ago, we have all taken a dozen or so breaths. We do it without thinking about it. But for people with lung disease, no breath is taken for granted. Asthma, COPD, pneumonia, and lung cancer are just some of the disorders that fall under the heading of lung disease, which is the number three killer in the United States. We have a lot to talk about in the next hour, so let's meet our panel of experts. Dr. Michael McCarthy is a pediatric pulmonologist with Providence Health. His specialties include cystic fibrosis and pediatric allergies. Dr. Jatin Patel is a pulmonologist with Providence Health. His speciali he specializes in general pulmonary medicine and interventional procedures, particularly those for lung cancer screening. And Dr. Stephen Thatcher is a radiation oncologist with Cancer Care Northwest and practices out of Sacred Heart Medical Center. Among his specialties is stereotactic body radiotherapy. And I want to thank you all for being here tonight. It's a mouthful, Dr. Thatcher. <laughs> Sorry about that. yeah. It's okay. We'll get to that in just a moment. I, I want to encourage all of you to uh, send in your emails or please call us with questions tonight. It's an excellent opportunity to ask our panel of experts uh, questions while we have them here. And uh, let's first talk about each of your specialties as it pertains to our topic tonight of lung health. Dr. Thath Thatcher, let's start with you. Yeah, so I'm a radiation oncologist, which just means I treat cancer with radiation, so I help design plans for different tumors and how to best uh, you know, effectively treat the tumor and minimize side effects. Mm -hmm. This is a specialty, though, that has become very advanced in the last few years. Yeah, it's really an exciting field to be in. I mean, the advances have happened rapidly. Um, for It's been a great benefit to patients, of course, um, but it's a it's exciting to be in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Explain the term that I uh, that I stumbled over at the beginning of the show. <laughs> sure, uh, the shortened name of it is SBRT or stereotactic body radiation therapy. But what it is is it's a fancy way of, of giving a high powerful dose of radiation to a very pinpoint accurate part of the body. So mm -hmm. something we weren't able to do. Uh, yeah, we, we've been able to do that similarly for what's called gamma knife for the brain, but it's been more difficult to do in the lung because, uh, you know, as you breathe, tumors move. Uh, it's right next to the heart, the heart beats, and it's difficult to, to localize that. But now with our newer techniques, we're able to do what we call a four-dimensional CT scan. We can track the motion. We can even limit the motion of the diaphragm in some ways. Uh, get a CT scan that will help us plan it, circle the areas we want to hit, circle the areas we want to miss, and arrange, you know, 50 or so beams all focused on that one spot. And basically zap it. Wow, very interesting. Dr. Patel. Well, I'm a general pulmonologist with a special interest in lung cancer as well, and, but I deal with asthma, COPD, um, pulmonary fibrosis, or scarring of the lungs. I do also help with transition from pediatrics to adult medicine. Uh, so it's the whole gamut of breathing, breathing difficulties, coughing, wheezing. Um, Pulmonary medicine has made profound changes in the past 10 years with the FDA approving several medicines for pulmonary fibrosis, the paradigm of inhalers that are available um, through different proprietors on the market is great, so patients have choices. Lung cancer screening has changed how we look at cancer and how we're catching it earlier, as two-thirds of cancers are diagnosed in late stages and unfortunately non-curative. We're, we're making uh, early advances to diagnose it earlier and biopsy earlier. Um, 
it's just a fun field to be in. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And Dr. McCarthy, you deal with the kids. I do. I'm a pediatric pulmonologist, and uh, uh, one of my special areas of interest is cystic fibrosis. Uh, and that's an interesting and wonderful field because it's a, it's a very serious condition that used to shorten lifespans tremendously, but as advances have been made, our patients are living longer and longer, and we now are treating about half of our patients in the cystic fibrosis clinic are adults, uh, and we even have had a couple of adults in their 60s that, that we've treated uh, with CF. Um, and we also see a lot of asthma and miscellaneous other lung diseases that children suffer from. And uh, we do respiratory allergy as related to those conditions. Mm -hmm. This time of year, we're going to start <coughs> seeing a lot of flu. Um, so that's going to come into play for both adults and kids. Is this the time of year we should be getting our flu shot to make sure that we don't end up with uh, a respiratory condition like the flu? Absolutely. I think as you start into later stages, September into October and early November, um, this is where it's very important for our patients at higher risk with COPD, known asthma, uh, adolescent onward to elderly patients on O2 oxygen therapy who have known moderate severe COPD or asthma or immunocompromised should be getting it. Mm -hmm. And kids as well? Absolutely, yes, and, and really I think uh, uh, universal flu shots for, for young children and probably up to all age groups, uh, I, I strongly encourage that, but particularly uh, kids with lung disease, and I agree this is the perfect time. I always get a little concerned each year when people run out and get their flu shots too soon in, in August if they're available, because often you're going to be, the flu season is going to be a bit later and your protection may have worn off, so this is perfect timing, Halloween. Mm -hmm. And this can be quite serious. We are talking about, when we say the flu, so often people will think a stomach virus, but the flu itself, the influenza, is actually a respiratory condition or can be. Uh, absolutely right, yes. And uh, yeah, f uh, flu, you know, people are always saying, well, I've got the flu, and you're right, it's confused with the stomach flu, which is not the flu. And also, there's so many other respiratory viruses, but uh, uh, the real flu, which the shot protects against, is not here yet and will probably come December, January, even as late as March. Is there any truth uh, when people are fe fearful of getting a flu shot because they think they're going to get the flu from the shot? Well, it's false premise. It's a, um, it's a immune response to uh, a, a covering of a, of a previous virus and live vaccines aren't used for influenza. Having said that, it's viruses from previous years that we sort of compile the vaccine from and you can probably add to that a little bit but having said that it's not a live virus therefore you don't get infected with in immunization. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get the flu by getting a flu shot? No, no, no. Okay. It's a false premise. <laughs> we actually have our first call uh, coming in from Steve here in Spokane. Hi, Steve. Hi. Thank you for calling. Do you have a question? I have a question. My wife died of ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, four years ago. Can the doctors explain what it is, how it occurs, and what should be done to treat it? Dr. Patel? It's a pretty complex disease, seen usually in a critical care environment in the ICU, but ARDS adult respiratory distress syndrome is where we're all breathing 21% oxygen, ambient air, and with that, our oxygen levels are 96 to 100%. ARDS is an acronym um, that develops when you have an enormous gap between what we absorb and from the ambient air. It requires additional oxygen to keep our blood levels normal with oxygen. And it leads to stiffened lungs, wet lungs. It leads to what's called edema, bogginess of the airways. And unfortunately, it leads to respiratory failure. And by definition, that's when your oxygen level stops or drops less than 88%. It leads to an intensive care admission. And then depending on whether it's mild, moderate, severe, sort of is a surrogate for how long you may be on a respirator or a breathing machine. Um, the treatment is time and you have a pro-inflammatory state where the lungs are very boggy and they're very moist, and so you don't absorb the oxygen very well. Oxygen is a basic nutrient of life, like, like oxygen, so is glucose. And when you're not getting fed the oxygen, other organs tend to fail as well. So the heart has to work harder, kidneys need to work harder. And so unfortunately, you start developing other organ dysfunction or organ failure. It's a lot more complex than, you know, um, the disease. Is it rare? It, it, it's 
there's a bit, a bit of a loaded question because mm -hmm. I see that from an, as an intensivist um, in that sort of co clinical context in the ICU. But it is rare overall, um, but it's a syndrome where you have a deprivation of oxygen absorption related to whatever number, you know, causes. A person with pancreatitis or infection, um, pneumonia, whatever it may be, may lead to your lungs failing. And essentially, you're not absorbing enough oxygen. So the treatment is time, time on a respirator, mm -hmm. and allowing your heels to, uh, lungs to heal. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Thatcher, lung cancer, uh, is smoking still the number one cause? Yes. Mm -hmm. But there are other reasons people get lung cancer as well. True. Yeah. Um, you know, radon exposure can, can be... Um, uh, you know, actually, non-smokers, of course, can get uh, lung cancer, but by far, no, number one is, is smoking, for mm -hmm. sure. What yeah. are some of the warning signs if somebody starts to feel <laughs> some symptoms? Well, so un unfortunately, it, 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 most of lung cancer presents late, um, and so it's tricky to catch it in the early stages. But, you know, persistent cough, coughing up blood, um, shortness of breath, occasionally chest pain, which are all pretty vague symptoms. That's why it can be kind of difficult to catch early. Mm -hmm. And um, then the screening process, um, if, if somebody presents with those symptoms, they would go through a screening process? Um, yeah, I mean, often they would show up in an ER or to a primary care doctor and um, you know, get a chest x-ray. Oftentimes you would see some sort of mass and then you'd get a CT scan and, and then uh, we would, yeah, there's a whole list of things that happen mm -hmm. after that, but yeah, often then biopsies and PET scans. And Is radiation always used? Uh, no, not always. Yeah, there's a, you know, cancer care is very much a team sport, so to speak. You know, you have surger surgical oncologists that do surgery, you have medical oncologists that give chemotherapy, radiation oncologists that give radiation, pulmonologists that, uh, you know, stent the airways. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different uh, tools in our toolbox for cancer. Mm -hmm. Talk about the, the radiation therapy uh, a little bit more and, mm -hmm. and what people um, go through. I know there used to be a lot of side effects. Are we still mm -hmm. seeing that? when it comes to radiation therapy? Yeah, I mean, certainly there are side effects. I, I think it, it depends a lot on what stage you have. You know, so if you catch a, a lung cancer in stage one, uh, it, you know, it's actually pretty easy to treat from a radiation standpoint. Oftentimes, surgery is the standard there. But if the patient can't get surgery, then you can do these fancy techniques like uh, stereotactic body radiation, where often the patients really don't notice anything aside from maybe some fatigue. Hmm. Then as you go up in stage, you know, oftentimes we treat stage three lung cancer with um, you know, six weeks of radiation and, and chemotherapy, and oftentimes you do have more significant fatigue, often pain with swallowing, and, um, you know, there certainly can be more side effects the, the higher the stage goes. Mm -hmm. Are people living longer? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, we're getting, you know, each field has progressed, you know, uh, maybe, you know, Dr. Patel can talk about that as well. Um, but, yes, so even in stage four where people are, are, are living longer now um, because of a, you know, stepwise progression in basically all fields. Mm -hmm. And the key is catching it early. Oh, actually, I agree with Dr. Yeah. Thatcher. We're fortunate to have um, him and his colleagues available locally and regionally. But having said that, um, the paradigm shift has changed because, like he astutely said, most of the cancers in lung are um, diagnosed very late in stage. And so the earlier we can diagnose it, it's better. So the NCC guidelines, the United States Preventive Task Force, have compiled through evidence of over 20,000 patient encounters where if you're between uh, your mid-50s to mid-70s who have uh, a 30-pack year tobacco history and have quit within 15 years or an active smoker, one should get a low-dose CT scan to diagnose for early-stage cancer. It's funny, uh, we've talked about mammography and we've come a long way with breast cancer screening, but the odds of catching an actual breast cancer, and you can correct me, but is around 1 in 900 screens. But if you get your high-risk patients, you can catch one in 300 CT scans. And that's profound. You know, we always catch, like you said, we're talking about placing patients in remission for cancer or subduing or abating the growth of the cancer. But could you imagine actually curing a lung cancer where your mortality is almost 100%? Certainly, you can prolong life in stage 3, 3A, B, 4 disease in different stages in the latter. But I, I think it's profound that we can cure a stage 1 cancer, but we have to catch these a lot earlier. Um, there is palliative treatments available endobronchially or within the airway that we can do to help abate some of the symptoms of coughing, wheezing, and shortness of breath. But like you said, sometimes these symptoms are caught later in stage. But sometimes it can be ominous. You may have a cough because you've got post-nasal drip, or someone comes to their primary care doctor with 
an infection that just does not go away, or just feeling weak or fatigued, or have had three courses of antibiotics and still feeling poorly. That's where, you know, and we're very fortunate. We've got a very astute primary care um, um, group of physicians in town that can facilitate chest x-rays followed by CT scans for lung cancer screening, catch the disease much earlier. We have uh, Patty calling in from uh, Newport. Hi, Patty. Hi, thank you for taking the call. Absolutely. Uh, I had a couple questions, actually, one quick one. Uh, can you have a lung problem and still have a clear x-ray? And the other one is, do, is there a, with the connective tissue or lupus-like disorders, can that involve the, the lungs or the bronchial that can cause quite a bit of cough or that sort of thing? Um, absolutely. <laughs> the short answer, Patty. Yes. Uh, well, you know, repeat your first question again. Well, if you have a clear chest lung, X-ray, yeah, right. chest X-ray, uh, can you have a problem with your lungs? Absolutely. You know, you can have an underlying lung disorder and miss 30 to 40 percent of actual pathologies in the, on a chest X-ray, and it depends on the quality of the chest film, um, how the contrast is, and there's a lot of technical aspects to a chest x-ray, but you could have uh, an abnormality and not see it on a basic chest film. Um, as far as your second question, connective tissue disease is, um, uh, lupus itself can have lung manifestations as well as its cohort diseases like scleroderma, um, systemic sclerosis, Sjogren's disease, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, you have four pillars of building tissue collagen one, two, three, four. If there's an abnormality, it can manifest as lupus or, you know, rheumatoid if your immune system overacts. And it can attack your lungs, and it can attack your lungs by causing inflammation. It can be very subtle. It can cause cough. It can cause wheeze. It can cause shortness of breath. Or you're not able to complete your basic activities with walking up a flight of stairs or dressing yourself or bathing yourself. And it could be very subtle, and it can happen over uh, weeks to months to years. Um, it can lead to vascular disorders in the lung as well called pulmonary hypertension where um, if you imagine your lungs in a figure eight, your heart sits in the middle, the lungs sit on top, the body's on the bottom, but passively returns back to the heart, gets pumped to the lungs, gets oxygenated. But that pipeline between the right heart and the lungs, the pressures can rise in certain connective tissue patients and can present with shortness of breath, swelling of the ankles, mm. coughing, wheezing. And it's as a result of high pressures on the right side of the heart and lungs. Um, Rheumatoid arthritis has 20 different manifestations in lung, everything from nodules to fluid buildup to scarring the lungs. It can lead to nodules, it can lead to rib pain, it can lead to laryngeal problems, voice problems. That's a great question. Hmm. So autoimmune diseases ac Absolutely. actually come into play quite a bit. When it comes to kids, Dr. McCarthy, they can't always tell you if there's a problem. So parents need to be watching for breathing issues, whether it's asthma or allergies or things that may arise. So what, what can you tell parents about watching their kids or looking for those signs if there happens to be a problem? Well, I think one of, one of the telltale signs is abnormal cough. And it's actually difficult in kids, maybe in adults too, to really define the difference between a normal cough and abnormal cough. Every time you get a cold, you know, how long should your cough go on? Should it last a week? Should it last a month? Um, does it seem excessively severe? Does it keep you up all night versus cough that's no big deal? Uh, but most astute parents will have a gut feeling about it. And I think most kids grow up sort of being labeled as, that's a coughing kid. And other kids will grow up and you know, they're not really a cougher. But cough is sort of the biggest thing uh, that, that I think parents can be, you know, clued into watching for. Uh, in, and a lot of coughers, by the way, are asthmatics. That's a very common cause of, of, of abnormal cough. If you have, just speaking about asthma, if you have uh, more severe asthma with the sort of the classical, what we all think of as asthma is wheezing and shortness of breath and ending up in the emergency room and so on, that's not going to escape attention. You know, nobody has to be taught how to look for that. You're going to know that something is wrong. So I really, I really emphasize and probably a lot of the new patients that we see in our practice are kids that have for years just been abnormal coughers and they've missed a lot of school and so on and that's something that that uh, I think we can often help with. Mm -hmm. Where do you begin then as a doctor if a kid comes in as a as being a cougher having that issue? 
Uh, I ask a lot of questions. <laughs> I think the, the, the truth is most often in the history. Um, and of course, the parents are the, the surrogates for, for the children, the young children. But uh, kids are very astute, too, and they can describe what it feels like. Um, so we want to know all sorts of things about uh, under what circumstances the symptoms occur, what makes it worse, what makes it better what medications have been tried by your primary care doctor, um, and just getting get a, a strong feel of all the, the subtleties of the symptom that we're talking about. We have Mary here in Spokane. Hi, Mary. Hello. Do you have a question? Yes. It, uh, actually, it's a three-part question uh, concerning interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis. Can you have both of those? conditions at the same time, or does the interstitial lung disease uh, go away? But I know the pulmonary fibrosis does not. And if uh, a person has an increasing cough that wasn't there for a little while, but now there's more cough, uh, does the person need to go um, contact his doctor? Um. That's a great question. Interstitial lung disease is an umbrella term for framework lung disease. So if you imagine your lungs, like this room, has f several walls. You have paint, drip rock, 4x4s, and insulation. That gives you the structure of this room. Your lungs have a structure. Um, interstitial lung disease is where you have matting down or kinking or portions of 4x4s that are not working properly or they're kinked. And so those areas fail. And under the, the umbrella interstitial lung disease, there's different clinical manifestations, and one of them being cough, something sometimes shortness of breath, sometimes swelling of ankles, sometimes a, a pneumonia that doesn't go away. Sometimes it presents over months and years. Other times it's subtle, and it was incidentally found on an X-ray. Um, <clears throat> pulmonary fibrosis and interstitial lung disease. It's one of the several types of interstitial lung disease. There's without getting too academic, there's usual interstitial pneumonitis that you get sometimes with connective tissue disease. There's idiopathic that we don't know why. There's sometimes um, a tobacco-related interstitial lung disease called disquamative. There's um, drug-related interstitial lung diseases. So the astute patient should you know, prompt the attention of their primary doc, and most primary docs will lead to a chest x-ray that's up to at least a CAT scan and then uh, a rather aggressive follow-up with a pulmonologist. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Darlene in Edmonton. Hi, Darlene. Hi there. Do you have a question for our doctors? I do. I wanted to know what tools are in their toolbox for COPD. Uh, are there any new treatments out there? Uh, is there any hope for COPD patients, or is it all totally progressive downhill? COPD. Right. That's actually an umbrella term as well, is it not? That's right. It's COPD is an acronym for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So start with how we breathe. There's two parts, breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in is a passive, I mean, an active inspiratory portion. It's, it comprises a third of your respiratory cycle. Breathing out is two-thirds and is passive. COPD is a disorder of expiration, exhalation, where you lose the elasticity in your lung. The equal to that would be filling up an empty bottle uh, with water and then closing the faucet and turning the bottle upside down, and you get this bottleneck effect. Equally, you have flow of air into the lungs, but you can't express it out, you can't exhale. So patients feel they they're just can't get enough breath in, or they start coughing, or they wheeze. Thankfully, there are progressing, you know, in therapies that are, are there, but there's some subtle things. Patients with COPD, unfortunately, it takes 10, 12 years before we get lung function tests. It also takes almost 20 years before it's diagnosed. And whilst they're, you know, actively smoking or secondhand smoke or occupational exposures, there's several reasons for COPD, not just tobacco. Having said that, by the time we get spirometry, most of the lung functions lost around two-thirds of it. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the loss of lung function is precipitously lost in the first 10 to 12 years. And patients can be completely asymptomatic, without cough, without wheeze, without shortness of breath. And then finally, when they get to their primary complaining of shortness of breath, we realize when we finally get lung function tests done that, that they are already at the moderate level or severe level of loss of lung. Mm. In a non-smoker, you lose around one ounce per year of lung function and or volume. Active tobaccoists lose around three to four ounces per year. There was an interesting study done in the 80s in England where they followed 860 plus men and they were active tobaccoists. 
and they watch their lung function astutely every 6, 12, 18, 24, so forth, for 10 years. And the retention of that study was pretty good. But what they saw was this decline, and that's how I know 3 to 4 ounces is lost per year that you smoke. And you may be completely asymptomatic till you hit 40 or 50, and all of a sudden you can't do, you can't bend forward, you can't get up that flight of stairs, you can't do the basic things that you take for granted. What we know also, when they did stop smoking, they've continued to follow them to that 10-year period. The loss of lung function is reduced to that of a non-smoker within a year. So you may have a precipitous so fall while smoking. So you can start to correct the you problem. You can not necessarily correct back to normal for your cohorts or that of a non-smoker, but the decline in lung function comes to that of a non-smoker after a year or two. Not to, you know, not talk, I'm not talking about the coronary benefits of uh, quitting tobacco, but so that there's some interest there where we should be talking about stopping smoking, tobacco cessation is 98% of our game. Then there's therapy. Um, you know, asthma is not the same as COPD. COPD is not asthma. When I was growing up through fellowship, we had a certain set of inhalers that we gave all patients who, had, who were coughing, wheezing, and or short spest slash asthma COPD. The, the, the gold criteria, which is a consortium of um, that facilitate COPD management. And they've given us a nice uh, tabulated form of how we treat COPD. And there's different inhalers that are available that are out there that include not just inhaled steroids, but long acting um, muscle relaxers in the airways. Your muscles are a tree and the, as, like a tree, the airways get smaller and smaller, but the middle airways are wrapped by muscle. And in a COPD patient, that airway is thick and is a large rind, and the muscle layer is very constricted. So a flow of air through a narrow passageway leads to coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath. These medicines relax that muscle. They also reduce the secretion of certain glands that become large and boggy and wet and cause that sputum production. And it can also dry up that secretion. If we get patients earlier on those therapies, the decline in lung function we know prospectively decreases, which is great. That means less symptoms, less severe disease. So there are therapies available. And we've made great strides in the last five to t uh, 10 years with COPD management. Mm -hmm. But the key 98% begins with not smoking or quitting tobacco. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to stay on the uh, topic of uh, COPD. When diagnosed with COPD, a patient has to deal with a lot of things from managing the symptoms of the disease to juggling oxygen bottles and inhalers. It's a major life change that continues to evolve as the disease progresses. But it can be a quality life, especially with the right coaching. We met a local man who found out that uh, with just a little bit of help, he can maintain an independent lifestyle. How's your breathing today? <coughs> this year, Don Owens was a regular at the St. Luke's Rehabilitation Institute for Pulmonary Rehab. Breathing can be a problem. There are days when I can get up and go for hours and days when I can't get up and walk five feet without getting out of breath. He was diagnosed 12 years ago with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I smoked for about 45 years. I had pneumonia at an early age. Owen says he's always led an active life and at first after diagnosis his COPD didn't bother him but the disease is progressive and over the last two years, his need for oxygen has doubled. I can't go anywhere without making sure I'm gonna have enough oxygen to get through the day. And things that used to come easily are not as easy anymore. There are times now when I get out of air just drying off after a shower. When his doctor suggested he enter a pulmonary rehab program, Owens was resistant. I used to doing things on my own. It bugs me to have to ask people to do things for me now. But as things got more difficult, he decided to give it a shot. Yeah, 50 RPMs, that looks great. I am active, but I've come to realize that I need the structured exercise. So I came back to Luke's to get the structure back in my life. Now Owens is a graduate at St. Luke's. The exercise portion of the program helps patients with endurance and helps them make the best use of their oxygen. But this program goes well beyond exercise. Our goal with pulmonary rehab is to really help our patients gain um, a better understanding of their pulmonary disease. We have a variety of education topics that cover more than just pulmonary topics that they get to learn. Like we go through the anatomy and physiology, we really want to help our patients understand disease processes. Owen still does not like asking or receiving help. Fortunately, my wife has a good sense of humor about things like that. And 
but he has to admit that pulmonary rehab has made his life better. I want to do the best I can, and sitting around is not really an option. And once a patient is referred by their doctor to the pulmonary rehab program at St. Luke's, they attend three one-hour sessions per week for approximately 12 to 24 weeks before graduating the program. And Dr. Patel, uh, Don Owen had a wonderful attitude about how he lives his life. He wanted to make sure he stayed active. How important is it, uh, say, the program that he went through at, at St. Luke's to maintain his lifestyle? I think it's great. And these are the subtle loss of activities of daily living. Mr. Owen spoke about not bathing, not able mm-hmm. to button his own Simple shirt. Simple things. Just the basic activities of daily living. And it progresses with COPD, but we can catch it with therapy. There is a level of muscle memory. So if you don't use it, you lose it. And what's refined here, we know through exercise physiology, is that if you work through that shortness of breath and understand why you're short of breath, you can do that treadmill at one met, two met, three mets, and these acronyms is how they measure his lung function and how well he can exercise. And there's a huge, you know, studies in, I'm sure, in um, uh, pediatric medicine looking at cardiopulmonary rehab. Uh, the Australians have come really far, and so have the English. And we're coming there where we're pushing patients through that sense of breathlessness and know that you're going to do just fine because they watch your oxygen levels, they watch your heart rate, they watch your blood pressure, and understand that we can rebuild and recondition you and help you cope with that level of breathlessness. If you don't know why you're breathless, it provokes anxiety. And anxiety, part of the symptoms is that stifling sensation. Mm-hmm. And they work with them on a psychosocial level as well. Well, we have an email, and this is for you, Dr. McCarthy. Uh, This uh, woman, Susan, is in Okanagan County, and she says, I'm in my 70s, and I have a CF, uh, I am a CF carrier. Two siblings died of this disease. Can my grandchildren and their parent be screened to see if they are at risk? If one of my children shows no sign of CF, could they still be a carrier? Okay, I love this question. This is great. Um... Uh, cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease, and uh, uh, the advances made in the last 20 years or so in terms of understanding and identifying the specifics of the gene are just incredible, um, and the practical ways for screening. And, and the answers are, first of all, in terms of the children who don't have any signs of CF, absolutely. People who carry the gene uh, don't have any recognizable symptoms, and, and that's one of the mysteries of, of the disease. Uh, but uh, it's very important to be aware of that. And it, it, the gene is common, too, about 1 in 20 to 1 in 30 people in the population, uh, primarily Caucasian population, um, uh, carry it. So, so it's, it's out there and it's around. Uh, when you have a family like this, then you're highly on the alert for for carriers. And um, what we usually recommend, we can do it a few different ways, but the basic answer is yes, all these individuals in the family who are uh, of uh, pertinent or of childbearing age and, and interested in having children and so on and so forth can be screened. Um, and uh, a few years ago, we could just screen for a small number of the of the possible mutations. Now we can screen basically for every possible mutation by by different ways. It's kind of expensive, though, as you as you might expect. Um, and one of the things we like to do in, in in at least certain cases is to refer families to our genetics clinic. We have a wonderful genetics clinic at, at Providence, and get some help with sort of mapping out who is likely to carry the gene, who is not likely to carry the gene, and hone in on really who should be tested. But it's great. Uh, it's just a fantastic example of what geneticists have done for us through the years. And a way for families to stay proactive and, and know that information as Absolutely. they move forward. Well, we have Marion in Moses Lake with a question tonight. Hi, Marion. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. I've got sarcoidosis of the lungs, and I've had it now for, oh, my gosh, since 1999. And I've got my right lung is dead, and I've got three, a quarter of my left lung left. And I've been on oxygen for the last six years now. I was wondering, I knew Bernie Mac died of it, and I was wondering how I got this, and why? Is it a part of cancer, or what is it? 
Hmm. Sarcoidosis is a very rare disease. Um, we really don't know in 2016 why patients get sarcoidosis. The demographics is typically 40 um, African American, equatorial countries, Norwegian countries, certain Thai, um, East Indian, North Indian heritage. So the, there's a bit of a bias here in North America, but having said that, we don't know why, but what we do know, it sort of behaves like an autoimmune disorder where you've got a hyper-functioning soldier that uh, starts secreting or uh, spewing out this pro-inflammatory uh, cell type, and it leads to injury in the lungs, in the lymph nodes, in the eyes, in the kidneys, in the liver, and it can be subtle. Two-thirds of patients don't even know, but it was incidentally found with enlarged lymph nodes. Of the remaining patients who do progress, it can lead, lead from, leave the lymph nodes and progress into the tissue of the lung. And if it continues to progress, it leads to chronic airway inflammation and the framework, the interstitial disease process kicks in. And it can lead to pulmonary fibrosis. Um, there's different stages, one, two, three, and four. And it's the progression from lymph node out to the periphery of the lung. Treatment typically is watchful, waiting, meaning watch, and it resolves in the majority of patients. If it doesn't, the option is high-dose steroids. And still, if you don't resolve or the lymph adenopathy or the scar in the lungs progresses, then there's steroid-sparing medications out there as well. Mm -hmm. I want to get to another email this evening from Shirley in Spokane Valley. Shirley says, I developed RAD after a bad cold. I've been taking uh, Singulair now for a couple of years. I still have a sporadic cough and some seasonal allergies. What other treatment might I need? RAD, RAD? Yeah, another acronym, Heritage, used, you know, when I was growing up, Reactive Airways Disease. I tend not to use that. I'm not sure, um, Glenn, if you do. I agree with you. Yeah, um, it's... What I recall RADS is a temporal relationship, meaning there's a time of whatever insult to the lungs and then usually 12 to 16 weeks later, the coughing, the wheezing, the shortness of breath resolves. And we know that's usually a res result of an exposure to something, in this case, a virus. You can get a post-viral bronchitis can, that can last for 12 to 16 weeks. RADS that Len now is used in slash in exchange for asthma mm. is a sort of a chronic inflammatory disease. And Asthma now is defined as allergic, non-allergic, phenotypically, meaning how it presents could be, it varies. You know, you don't just call it allergic asthma anymore or non-allergic. It could be, you know, due to obesity. It could mm. relate to reflux. It could relate, relate to allergic rhinitis, post-nasal drip. Um, I would argue that maybe it's not RADS, it's asthma. And she may have allergic asthma. And the uh, national guidelines for asthma, uh, we all sort of... Um, is our Bible, you start singular and then add on an albuterol inhaler that works for four to five hours. And if you're using that more than two or three times a day or having nocturnal nighttime symptoms, we add on therapy like an inhaler with a steroid, then something uh, with a, a higher dose steroid with albuterol. And there's a stepwise action to treat it. But I, I would imagine your phone caller probably has asthma rather than rats. Okay, so an antiquated term. I believe it to be. Okay. Gary in Edmonton uh, with a phone call. Hi, Gary. Hi. Um, I've got a question that is just a little bit, uh, might be a follow-up on the previous question. I'm uh, suffering from two chronic diseases, so I, I get into poor health once in a while. Anyways, I'm, I'm using, I got a cold, and I've got a very deep um, uh, mucus, and I'm using um, a, a mucumist right now via nebulizer. And I'm wondering if there are any other alternatives I could use or consider to help clear this congestion, please. Well, it's actually normal. I read six to eight viral prodromes per year. So if you have it biannually, it may be an exacerbation of a chronic problem like post-nasal drip or silent reflux, which are mimickers of asthma or chronic bronchitis. Your food pipe sits right behind your windpipe, and so you may have silent reflux and not the typical heartburn or that pressure or that burning sensation. And you may have this bilious or bile that comes up and drops onto your vocal cords and causes you to have this cough twice a year. Post-nasal drip may be very subtle. One-third of patients drip forward, a third have sinus congestion, and the other third drip back, and it presents with not <clears throat> or snorting or coughing. It's just hoarseness in your voice or aspirin or coughing, having episodes of um, violent coughing. If it settles in and it occurs in, like the previous caller calls it, you know, patients 
will be termed reactive airway disease because if you aspirate some of that stuff into your lungs, mm -hmm. it makes your lungs inflamed. And that's what causes the coughing and wheezing to last for several weeks. There are bronchodilators that you can get from your primary um, steroids, depending on what symptoms um, uh, they come with. And then on clinical exam, it may predicate a certain treatment. But I think you probably want to venture in, see a primary, and talk about uh, additional therapies. And see if you actually have silent reflux or post-nasal drip, or if you have asthma, if he's a smoker, perhaps COPD. Dr. Thatcher, I want to work you back into the conversation here and, and talk about uh, the, the radiation uh, treatments for lung cancer and how specialized they've become. Um, do the treatments now affect any of the other organs, or are you so generalized now or zeroing in on that lung, particularly for lung cancer, that you can avoid any damage to any of the other organs? Um, <clears throat> well, yes and no. So, again, it all sort of relates to what stage and how, you know, the burden of disease someone has. If they have a very large tumor that's right next to the heart, then certainly there could be some damage to the heart. Um, but oftentimes with our newer treatment techniques, we're able to really sculpt the, the, the dose and the beam much better than we were able to in the past. We're also able to line up each day because we, we have what we call a, well, it's a, it's a, it's a CT scan that's mounted onto our machine that gives the radiation, and we can make millimeter adjustments each day to give us more accuracy. But <clears throat> even with that, you know, if you have a lymph node that has cancer in it that's right next to the esophagus, you will still potentially um, get that pain with swallowing when you have uh, treatment. And you, honestly, a lot of times the, the biggest thing we worry about is um, a lot of times you have a patient who's been a lifelong smoker. Mm. They don't have great lungs to begin with, and then they get cancer. And then any normal lung that you damage on top of that Sometimes they, they notice that and they can become shorter of breath. So oftentimes it's the lung itself that we're worrying about. But I guess the short answer would be it depends. Mm -hmm. depends on what stage mm -hmm. you're in and how much disease and where. Mm -hmm. And typically how long are treatments? Um, the actual, so if you, you know, usually it's a daily treatment. Um, and the treatment, the, the radiation itself is probably five, ten minutes. It's, it's quite quick. But it takes as much that, you know, lining you up takes as, as much time as it does to treat you. So it's pretty quick. You can be in and out of the office 30 minutes. Hmm. What about lifestyle during that treatment time? Are you, can, you can expect to, to feel ill or? Usually not. So radiation in the chest usually does not make you feel nauseous. Um, you know, often some mild fatigue can accompany that. And usually the, the first half of treatment is definitely easier than the second half of treatment. And it's that second half of treatment um, that, you know, if, if the tumor is near the esophagus, you can get pain with swallowing. Also depends on whether we're giving chemotherapy along with it. Um, but this, you know, the, the very focal stereotactic type of treatments that we have that just treat the one lung nodule or, or lung tumor, you know, that can be done in as short as five treatments and they can walk in and walk out. So it's radiation, you know, you never see it, you never feel it. Mm -hmm. No smoke comes out of your ears. Nothing crazy happens <laughs> while you're getting it. It's, you know, it's a, you, you walk in and you walk out. So it's, it's quite easy to actually get the radiation itself. It never hurts. Okay. And uh, Brian in Shawila. Hi, Brian. Hello. You have a question? Yes, I was wondering if the doctors had heard anything in regards to last week. I heard a brief mention of a FDA drug that was uh, near approval to reduce lung cancer uh, by 50%. And I didn't know if it was a treatment, the symptoms. And I wonder if that was attributed to the Cuban medical research that's recently been available to the U.S. medical field uh, with the border being opened up. I heard that the Cubans had it in their medicine cabinets a couple years ago. Hmm. Dr. Thatcher, have you heard any? Um, <clears throat> I am not aware of that. You know, I don't know of any medicine that can necessarily prevent lung cancer itself. I mean, the main... There's obviously many lifestyle things that we can do to prevent it, the main one being not smoking, just, you know, overall good healthy diet, being active. But I'm not aware of any um, preventative medicines that would prevent it. Mm -hmm. And other than not smoking, which is, is obvious and, and comes up quite often on health matters, what are some of the other things we can do to, to reduce our risk of lung cancer? Um, well, we, we do radon testing, too. Um, and radon is prevalent in, Spok in the Spokane area. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's, I think it's maybe 5 to 10 percent of uh, causes of, of lung cancer. You know, um, asbestos, you know, if you had asbestos exposure, there are certain mining communities, uh, you know, northwest Montana has a few of them that uh, are, you know, can be predisposed to that. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, just living a good, healthy 
life never hurts you. Good diet, exercise that can only help you. And then if you do happen to get ill or have cancer, people who are fit coming in always do better than someone who's not. <laughs> mm -hmm. Asbestos. I know, Dr. McCarthy, um, this was one of the questions I wanted to talk to you about was uh, kids being exposed to asbestos because sometimes you don't know when this is happening. We have older homes in Spokane. Uh, that, that can also happen. So is there a risk f for kids that are exposed to asbestos? Well, I think the risk is long term. And, and I, I often have patients ask this question. And I mean, the simple answer is if patients coming to see me because of a cough or recurrent pneumonia or something like that, it has nothing to do with asbestos exposure in the home. But they're young children and they're going to live in a long life and the, the, the cancer risk will you know, potentially catch up with them if they've had that kind of exposure. So, uh, but it's kind of it's kind of a misunderstanding that a lot of patients have who are bringing kids in to see me. Mm -hmm. We have Vicky in Newport. Hi, Vicky. Hi. And your question? I have been diagnosed with uh, bronchostasis, and I was just would like to know more about this. Uh, how it comes about, what can be done for it, uh, is there a cure? Uh, I get out of breath, especially at night, especially lately, so I would like to try to understand this lung disease a little better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the term is correct, bronchostasis or bronchiectasis. I think that's what she yeah. means. Bronchiectasis is, again, another structural lung disease related to chronic inflammation, and in this case, usually an indolent infection that, you know, populates lungs from 20 years ago, or it could be immune, it could be autoimmune disorder, it could be from childhood uh, early infections, recurrent pneumonias, recurrent aspiration. So what it does is lead to chronic air, airway inflammation, and those chronically irritated airways start to kink on themselves, and that leads to stasis of sputum, and that leads to then colonization or growth of bugs that grow over years. And it presents with coughing or wheezing and can mimic asthma, can mimic COPD. Um, and it tends to settle in the base of the lung by, on both sides. Um, it can lead to uh, tenacious, tacky uh, mucus and sputum. And it can become acutely infected every so often. And it can be indolent and progressive, undulate over several years before it's actually diagnosed. The treatment, and there's cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, and non-cystic fibrosis. I'll, de I'll deal with so the latter. So they're related? Not related. They're, well, the adult population is slightly different unless mm. they come from Dr. McCarthy onward to adult medicine. But the non-CF element is airway clearance, meaning what you and I take for granted, that ciliary hair-like hair um, uh, rhythmic uh, sputum escalator that allows uh, peripheral mucus to be recruited into the central airways for you and I, what we take for granted, spit up or swallow. Bronchiectic patients don't. Mm -hmm. And so that mucus sort of cells in there, it can colonize. I guess um, Dr. McCarthy could probably talk a little bit about the CF bronchiectasis as well. And the yeah, I think, bronchi I think what you're saying is bronchiectasis can be caused by many different uh, underlying conditions. And in my world, cystic fibrosis is the big one, but that's the kind of lung damage that occurs in a patient with cystic fibrosis. In that case, it's because the secretions are thick in the lungs to begin with uh, from the underlying abnormality, and then you get infection, and then you get thicker secretions, and you get that kind of damage. Uh, people who are born with low immunity of one sort or another, which is not common, it's, a, it's rare to have true immunodeficiency, but those who are, can end up getting bronchiectasis. So, but treatments, a variety of things, tr treating infections one way or another, either chronically or intermittently, trying to raise the secretions with, with uh, uh, percussion and uh, ways of encouraging stronger cough and thinning the secretions. So there's tons of things to do, but it depends partly on what's the underlying cause of the bronchiectasis. Mm -hmm. Is this difficult to, to diagnose? Because it does present like... Like most things, there's a latency between symptoms starting and when we actually see the patients. And there's several encounters through different levels of providers. But once it's diagnosed through CAT scan and clinical intuition, um, the treatment is reasonable. It's like Dr. McCarthy said, recruiting the secretions, using percussion, using a vest. It's what you and I... They, it's counterintuitive. They complain of coughing and wheezing and shortness of breath, but we actually 
try and get them to cough a little bit more with percussion therapy, thinning up their secretions if they need antibiotics, if it's related to chronic infection. Becomes more productive that way. Right, and we want them to actually get it out. It's better out than in. And in the adult realm, you know, uh, it's using mucolytics and I mean, things that thin up the secretions, using bronchodilators like albuterol, using what Dr. McCarthy said, a cappella percussion devices uh, two, or three, two or three times a day, and that's part of the routine. Okay. We have another email, this one from Karen, and Karen writes, what is Vactor's syndrome, how rare is it, and what can be done for a person with it? Am I saying that correctly? Okay, uh, yes, yeah, basically, yes. Um, I don't know how, co how common this is. It's, it's a uh, uh, birth defect, basically, and it, uh, I don't think the cause is known. Uh, it arises during a certain part of fetal development, a certain uh, month along the way as a fetus is developing, and the letters stand for different organs that are that are involved. But uh, and there, uh, people can have one part or several parts of the syndrome. But basically, the trachea, the development of the large airway, is affected. The esophagus, which is the swallowing tube, that is affected. Uh, the spine can be affected. That's the V for vertebrae. Um, and it's, 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 there's, there's a wide spectrum of presentation because of, the number one, the severity, and number two, exactly which organs are affected. But it's multiple birth defects. Um, uh, frequency, I don't really know the number. I, do, do you know I that? Don't know. Um, it's, it's somewhat common in our practice, but that's because, you know, patients are referred to us from, from a widespread area. Um, and the, the kind of treatments are, are quite variable because, again, it depends on, on what the difficulties are. But it causes breathing problems, swallowing problems, surgery, often early surgery is, is uh, required to, to fix uh, uh, the underlying problems. But then there are lingering difficulties with reflux, with swallowing difficulties, with uh, uh, softening of the airways so that it's uh, difficult. You might even end up with bronchiectasis because of that. Um, and it can be uh, uh, it can be quite a challenge, but people can also do very well dissecting out the different parts and dealing with them as as with the tools that we have. Hmm. Leslie here in Spokane. Hi, Leslie. Thank you for waiting. Oh, thank you for taking my call. Um, I'm someone who presently has COPD from secondhand smoke. Um, and I have seasonal allergies, asthma, and I presently have pneumonia. And my question is, um, I have a number of treatment routines that I'm, um, and modalities that I use. Um, when I've done all the nebulizing, when I've used the oxygen 24-7, and the inhalers, and I still can't catch my breath. And the coughing continues to what I would consider an hysterical level, so that it's not quieted. What signals to me that I need to call 911 or go get uh, further help? That's a very good question. Oh. She describes severe asthma, and it's based off symptoms, and having chronic wheeze and shortness of breath not relieved with your regimen, and the key word, she said routine, and she has a regimen that she does do. I, see, I heard allergies. Um, I heard asthma slash COPD, secondhand smoke. Mm -hmm. And um, pneumonia. And pneumonia. And so, again, asthma, COPD, exacerbations or worsening in symptoms can behave like pneumonia. Um, it's not the same. Um, in the, from a, the academic part of me tells me that maybe it's just her asthma is not controlled very well. Can, as, can patients get COPD and not smoke? Absolutely. And that's why we don't have smoking in public places or in airplanes. I grew up in a time where if you went to the bathroom, you walked through the smoking area. I'm thankfully not symptomatic of any cough or wheeze, or, nor do I have COPD or asthma. But whilst we grew up, there was this chronic inflammatory response that was probably going on and that she was obviously susceptible. Plus, she describes coughing episodes that are violent. Most asthmatics, and probably a third if not more, have a post-nasal drip syndrome. And so the catarrh um, sort of drips down into the vocal cords, and if she aspirates, it can lead to these violent episodes. 
Having said that, your upper airways, your, your lining of your, your mucous membranes in your nose and your sinuses are the same up to the 20th generation of airway. So when this smolders, this smolders, and vice versa. Um, so which, when she gets into an episode like that, uh, and it's frightening, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, she does the right thing by asking for help immediately. And uh, the sense of uh, air hunger is profound and asthmatic. I guess I don't have asthma, but if you imagine breathing through a straw 40 times, that probably may, you may be able to empathize with the hunger for air that an asthmatic or which she suffers from. But there are asthma plans, action plans, and it evolves with a young asthmatic who then um, develops chronic asthma into adulthood. She should have a plan, and she should be monitoring her peak flows, looking at if she's got worsening symptoms, there's usually an action plan that her and her primary doctor can facilitate what to do in an emergent situation. Take three of your all puffs, wait 50 minutes. If you're still having symptoms, progress onto a nebulizer. If you're still having symptoms after half an hour, you need to go to the ER or urgent care and be seen because you may need steroids or you may need IV steroids or need to be hospitalized. Having said that, prevention is a big thing. So secondhand smoke, you know, avoidance. Um, uh, get on top of the allergens, the allergies. Find out what you're allergic to. I'm a big advocate for sinus rinses. Um, there's different proprietors out there where you use basic distilled water and a salt composition that you Neti can purchase. Pot. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the water and the salt uh, is a desiccant. It dries up the sinuses. And it can help abate or at least alleviate some of the discomfort uh, from that congestion, at least maybe reduce some of that post-nasal drip. Um, and she may not be cognizant of it. You know. And but kids, she's doing the right thing by calling 911 and getting to be seen immediately. And kids will learn that same action plan? Yes, absolutely. And I was going to say, you know, we see kids presumably fairly shortly after they've developed a problem. Maybe they've had it for a year or two or whatever. And, and asthma is, you know, every asthmatic is a little bit different from every other asthmatic. And it's always a learning process. And there's no great black or white answer for this kind of question. You know, you, you feel short of breath. You know, can you get in your car and get to the ER, or do you need 911? We don't really know, and the asthmatic has to kind of teach us. I'm talking about the asthmatic child, um, uh, and certainly it's better to be safe than sorry. And so we incur. And, and then after, you know, so there may be some some uh, unnecessary okay. runs to an emergency okay. room. And then after a while, the family learns, and they know what to look for, and they know when to call us, and they know when to head to the hospital. Okay. Well, we have run short on time. That uh, was a very fast hour. I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank uh, all of the callers and the emails that we received on Health Matters this evening. A uh, big thank you to the panel for being here and sharing their expertise. And if you're looking for more information on lung health, we've posted some very helpful links on our website, ksps.org. Join us on Health Matters on November 17th when we will focus on managing pain. I'm Teresa Lukens. Have a good night. Health Matters is made possible by our viewers, the friends of KSBS, and by Providence Healthcare. I'm Dr. Andrew Boulay, and when my wife had a cardiac arrest, I chose Providence because I knew that everything we needed for her complex care was available, from the emergency room to radiology to the nursing staff to the specialists we needed for her care. I'm Arnie Peterson, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I work at Sacred Heart for Providence Medical Group. When I needed my hip replaced, I chose Providence because of the professionalism and the care that I knew I'd receive. I never thought twice about going anywhere else.